Hey there, you're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 541. With today's episode, what martial artists have learned thus far in 2020. My name's Jeremy Lesniak. I'm show host. I'm Whistlekick founder. And what do we do here at Whistlekick? Well, what we do is anything we can in support of the traditional martial arts. And traditional martial artists, probably people like you. If you want to know more about what we do, what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you're going to learn about everything that we're doing, our projects and our products. It's also the easiest way to find our store. And if you make a purchase in there, you help us out. And if you use the code PODCAST15, that saves you 15%. And also lets us know that, hey, the podcast leads to sales. Martial Arts Radio gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We keep it easy. The show comes out two times each week. And the purpose of the show is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to support that work, of course, you can make a purchase at whistlekick.com, but there are plenty of other things you can do. You could share an episode. You could follow us on social media. You could tell a friend about what we're doing. You could pick up one of our books or our programs. You could leave a review, or you could support the Patreon. If you think the new shows we're releasing are worth a whopping 63 cents a piece, not to mention all the back episodes you get, you could support us for $5 a month. You could even do $2. That's the lowest tier. And if you go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash whistlekick and sign up there, you're going to get access to even more content. In fact, by the time this comes out, we've probably launched our new Patreon exclusive show. 2020 has been quite a year, and we've all learned a lot. Martial artists have learned a tremendous amount, at least. We've been given a lot of information. Whether we've learned from it, I can't say. But I've got six things here on a list that I've been thinking about that I think we should talk about. And it's my hope with an episode like this that I get you to consider, to contemplate what I'm saying and how it impacts your life, your school, where you train, how you train, maybe even why you train, rather than just a list of things that bum us out. The first thing, and I bet a lot of us knew this before, but it's been reinforced tremendously, training alone sucks. How many of us spent the majority of our training time in class and realized, hey, I love training, but oh, I don't love training by myself. My hands as high up as, as it can be with that question. I love training. And I do train on my own, but I don't love training on my own. There's a difference. I love training with other people. I love getting better with others, supporting them, having them support me, learning together. There's something in that process that really resonates for me that no matter what I do, I can't find a way to recreate that at home. And I know I'm not alone. So as we look at what training means, I think this realization is pretty substantial. Now, I know there are plenty of people out there, and, and some of you are listening to this, who have no problem training alone. Maybe you even enjoy training alone because you can work on whatever you want to work on, whenever, however, and that's awesome. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that that's wrong. In fact, I wish I liked training alone more, but I don't. And so what have I done as I've learned this? I've worked hard to incorporate training in small bits throughout my day. I've got a stand-up bag in the middle of my house, and I'm constantly playing with kick distance range. Not only with that bag, but all the various cabinets and doorknobs and the cat. Anything that I can punch or kick at, that's how I tend to flow through my home as I move around during the day. And is it a substitute? No but it's what works for me. And I think the main takeaway is those small pieces, those small bits. If you're not someone who's going to enjoy training alone, you're probably not going to dedicate an hour to it. So this is where something like Two Minute Martial Arts that we do, uh, you can find that on social media from us, or just picking a drill, just doing a little bit a few times a day, building a habit. Hey, every time I go to the bathroom, I'm going to throw... 10 kicks, something like that to work through it. Depending on where you are, as I record this, I'm recording this in September 
of 2020. Some states haven't allowed martial arts schools to open up yet. Maybe yours is one of them. For all we know, we might have to close schools again. Who, who knows what's coming in the future? So this is good information, a good uh, thing to consider. What would you do if you only had this space within your own home to train again? The second thing we've learned, online training can work, but it's a lot easier to use it for reviewing existing material with existing students rather than teaching new skills or onboarding new students. Now, notice I said easier, not impossible. It can certainly be done. But there are a lot of things out there that we're seeing that are working really, really well online. And this has been a bit of an eye-opener for many of us. Quite a few of us, and, and I'm going to count myself in this group, thought, hey, online training, virtual training, it's terrible. I don't think I, I would have said it was terrible but not nearly as good. Well, there are some really positive aspects to online training, especially if it's pre-recorded. You can do it whenever, you can do it wherever. You can have a group of people doing it. And on the flip side, the live training has actually, for a lot of schools, saved them. That live training, while not nearly as social and as energetic, as in-person training is, it worked better than a lot of us thought it would. And it's the reason that some martial artists and some martial arts schools have managed to survive. Number three, and I'm kind of intentionally burying this one in the middle because it's not a positive one. A lot of martial arts schools didn't have the loyalty from their students that they thought they did. Now, we've talked a bit about this and the fact that Martial arts schools are uniquely positioned to weather this storm if it's done right. That what we offer to our students as martial arts instructors is almost perfect. It's something that can be done at a distance. It's something that supports individual training. It's something that can be individualized. And it's something that focuses on a lot more than physical skill. Now, when I think about this and the impact that these restrictions have had on different martial arts schools, it's been really clear to me which schools went out of their way to provide value. That's the word. If you go back to some of the, the videos and the podcast episodes that we've done covering these subjects this year, it all comes back to value. There are schools out there that barely saw any dips in enrollment because they really quickly moved to online classes and they did everything they could to support their students. It was about service. And then, I'm sorry to say, there were plenty of martial arts schools who just kind of put up the white flag and said, please help me. If you want me to be here, if you want this school to be here on the other side of this, you have to help. Well, remember, people spend their time and money on things that they find to be valuable. And if you have to put out that request, maybe there's something in the value. Maybe there's something in, in the value that you provided that didn't translate well. I could dig really deep on this one, but it's a sad subject. So I'd rather just leave it there and let you think about it, or maybe you can go back and listen to some of the other episodes that we've done. Here's another subject that we tackled in a previous episode, online competitions. They can certainly work. I'll be honest, I've seen far more of them and far more participation in them than I ever would have imagined. And I think that's awesome. Competition is great. And while we're certainly not going to be able to have sparring competitions virtually, at least not until we get virtual reality and, and those motion capture suits less expensive and more integrated into society, there's been some really creative stuff. What started off as simply forms has morphed and people are really pushing the limits of what we can do with an online competition. And that's great. And I love seeing that. And is it a direct substitute? Is it as good of a substitute? No. But 
Here's one upside that I've seen. Because it doesn't require travel, I've seen people competing against others that they might not have otherwise competed against. Because it can be done with less anxiety, being pre-recorded and in your own home, I'm seeing people who normally aren't going to compete, competing. And these are all wonderful things. I think competition can really foster some great stuff in martial arts. So I'm really pleased to see what's happened there. Next, just from conversations and, and noticing things within myself, most of us rely on the social aspects of martial arts, training, and competition far more than we realized. Even if the people you hang out with day-to-day -day aren't martial artists, there's a good chance that the people that you lean on and have conversations with and talk to and about are martial artists. And if you're not someone who's prone to reach out and text or message people via social media, you've probably lost connection with those people. Well, you can change that. I've had to change that. Once we know what's important to us, we can make an adjustment. Once we know what feeds our, our soul, our heart, we can prioritize things and show what matters. The, the people we train with, we've talked about how important friendship and trust and respect is within the context of martial arts training. Even if you're not training side by side with these people, maintaining those relationships is important so that when it does come time for us to train in that way again, if you're not already, you haven't lost that connection. And then lastly, <laughs> this one showed up pretty recently. Everybody loves Cobra Kai. If you haven't seen Cobra Kai on Netflix, you should. It's a great show. But what's blowing my mind is how many people are watching Cobra Kai. Now, of course, there's a, a, a playful, personal element in me bringing this up. But guess what else? When we've talked about martial arts enrollment on this show, we've talked about the Bruce Lee era and the Karate Kid era and the Ninja Turtles era. And if, if you owned a martial arts school during those times, you saw how those cultural phenomena led to more students. Well, guess what? This is a perfect time. If you have a martial arts school and you are not paying attention to Cobra Kai and you're not looking at the ways that you could connect the interests behind this show with enrolling new students, especially adult students, you're missing an opportunity. If you haven't watched the show, please do it. Even if it's not your cup of tea, as martial artists, we don't have too many things come along that everyone, so to speak, watches. This is one of them. And it's possibly, I think it is, the best martial arts television show ever. It's great. I also recognize that I am pretty much the perfect demographic for this show. So you may not enjoy it as much, yet I think you have a responsibility as a martial artist, especially a martial arts school owner, to give it a whirl. And if you want to enroll new students during a very difficult time to enroll new students, I would suggest that there are some answers in there, not in the context of the show itself. Please don't be either Johnny or Daniel, but in tying some of your marketing and messaging to that show. It's something that I'm working with a few schools on, and it's, I gotta be honest, it's fairly easy. <laughs> it's pretty easy to, and fun to do some of this stuff. So don't underestimate it. Beyond this, what's 2020 taught you? Where do you stand as a martial artist now versus where you were on January 1st or March prior to all of these things that started happening? Has your relationship to the martial arts or to the martial artists around you changed? What's better? What's worse? What are your priorities now versus what they were? What are you going to do with the last few months of the year 
if things stay the same or they change. I just hope you'll think about it. I hope you'll contemplate what I've mentioned today in such a way that it gives you a better understanding of yourself and your place in the world as a martial artist. If you're willing to share your feedback, your thoughts on what this means, look for our posts on social media or go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Leave a comment under this episode, 541. While you're over there, you can also check out videos and links and social media for this and the other episodes. And if you're up for supporting what we do, please consider go to the store, whistlekick.com, use the code podcast15. You can also share this episode and maybe another episode, leave a review, tell a friend, or support the Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. If you see somebody out there wearing something with a whistle kick on it, make sure you say hello. And if you have guest suggestions or other feedback, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.